Okay, so I know that's a bit weird and you might feel quite unfamiliar, like you haven't done much, much set theory or that kind of thing, which is really what this is dealing with. Um, so let that sit in your brain for a little while. But as promised, I'm gonna give you another proof for this same result, which doesn't rely on um, this kind of weird sort of trick here. It's not a proof by induction at all. It's actually a combinatorial proof because I kind of alluded to this um, sort of very quietly as I was putting together this example here. Um, there is another way of thinking about this. This is really about choosing uh, combinations, right? Not permutations where the order matters. These are sets where the order doesn't matter. So we're gonna use our NCR notation to try and uh, come up with an alternative proof for this, okay? Now, the way I'm gonna do this is, uh, I think I'll have enough space here. I'm gonna call this proof two combinatorial approach. All right, how are we going to do this? Let's just go back to this idea here of A, B, and C. How did we come up with the, uh, the number of total subsets here, right? Well, I'm actually going to do this kind of in reverse. I'm gonna start with um, the smallest subset you can make, and then I'm gonna ramp up to the biggest subset that you can make, right? I'm no longer thinking of the relationship between the two member set and the three member set. I just wanna go straight to three members because then I can go straight to K members. I can generalize in a different direction, okay? So for starters, we had the, uh, the empty set is the smallest subset you can make. So I'm just gonna stick that over here. Uh, then what you've got is uh, the, all of the subsets that have one member. So that's A and then B and then C. There's just three of those, right? Then I can think about how many subsets have two members in them. Well, there's the A and B subset, there's the uh, B and C subset, and then there's the A and C subset. Again, there's three of those. And then lastly, I've got the subset which includes A and B and C. That's the subset with three. That's the biggest subset I can make. So I guess I'm gonna put a circle through there. Okay, now I want you to notice what's happened in the way that we've um, put these together, right? There's one empty set. There are, which color did I use? I think I used green. Uh, there are three of these subsets that include just one member. There are also three of these subsets that include two members. And then finally, there is the one subset that includes all of the members. One, and then three, and then three, and then one. Doesn't this look familiar? These are the binomial coefficients, right? I guess I would say this is uh, three choose zero. Um, then this was three choose one. This was three choose two. And then the last one was three choose three. Okay, now the reason why this is helpful is because now we have an expression for the number of subsets within a K member set directly through combinatorial notation, through our binomial coefficients. So I can say um, a K member set has, uh, let's just write it, right? KC0 plus KC1 plus KC2 all the way up until KCK subsets. That's the way that I formed these, right? I started with how many ways are there to choose zero, how many ways are there to choose one, and then how many ways are there to choose two, followed by or ended with how many ways are there to choose three, right? So this is just me generalizing that to if I had K, right? Now I just need to work out what does this thing add up to? Uh, KC0, KC1, KC2, all the way up to KCK. Now maybe you already have put together, like we've, we've proved this result from earlier on via induction, but how do I get to this result? How would you add up the sum of all these terms without using induction? Well, we already have notation for this, right? From the binomial theorem, which we actually proved just a few days ago. The binomial theorem, uh, big capital letters, states, and if you have some binomial, a to the power a plus b, all raised to some integer power, what do you get? And the answer is sigma, the sum of from um, zero all the way up to n of, and then here comes the binomial coefficient. Then you've got the term to do with a, and then you've got the term to do with b, right? Now, how do I take this binomial theorem here by binomial theorem, I think I can just squeeze it in if I write small enough. 
How do I use this to evaluate this, right? Well, this KC0, KC1, KC2, it's here. This is the actual part that I'm interested in, right? All I need is to set n equals k, and then this r down here will march up from zero all the way up to k, which is exactly what I want us to do. But then you've got these other bits in the binomial expansion, right? The a term and the b term. Now, that's irrelevant to here, right? I, I have no a's and b's. Or, rather than saying I have no a's and b's, I actually have invisible a's and b's because these are all kind of being multiplied by one. So therefore, I just need to pick a value for a and for b that will make all of this turn into one. And it seems to me the most sensible values for a and b to choose will be one, because watch what happens. Let, uh, firstly, I said n equals k, and both a and b equal one. Watch out, this is so quick, if you blink, you're gonna miss it, right? I'm gonna go one plus one to the n equals. The sum from r equals zero, should have said k instead of n, because I already did that substitution, of uh, k, c, r, and then this is one to the n, K, I should say, reflexes, uh, instincts, K minus R times one to the R. Okay, what's going to go, go, go on here, right? Well, I'm gonna get this term here is what I want, but everything over here is just going to become these ones up the top here, right? So they can be disregarded more or less, right? And then what do you get on the left-hand side? Um, you're gonna get two to the K. I'm gonna write that on the right-hand side. That's the two to the K, which I got from here. And then what do I have on the left? And the answer is, I've got the expansion of this sigma notation. It's kc0 plus kc1 plus kc2 all the way up to kck. And that's it. Like I already said that this is the number of subsets there are in a k member set. It's two to the k. That's it, full stop. So uh, perhaps you would have thought, like, why didn't we do it that way in the first place? And the answer is, well, it's really important to be able to have, number one, multiple ways to look at something um, because you gain insight each time. And number two, like one of the primary ways that we know um, that this method is right is because induction backs it up. Um, it's sort of like a mathematician's version of the scientific method. Like we're repeating this observation, this, this experiment as it were, except we are using um, deductive logic rather than instruments and measurements. Now, fun final fact. Uh, we know we first met the binomial coefficients years ago in Pascal's triangle, right? And what this tells us is that these are all of the terms in any single row of Pascal's triangle. Uh, that top number there represents what row you're in, and then the zero, one, two, all the other way to k um, sort of increments you along the row. So did you ever notice that the sum of all of the numbers in any row of Pascal's triangle will equal a power of two, not just a power of two, the power of two of that row. For example, the first row is just one, that's two to the power of zero. The second row adds up to two, which is two to the power of one. The next one adds up to four, which is two squared. Then you're gonna get eight, which is two cubed, 16, which is two to the four, and you can check and convince yourself that the last row I've drawn here is 32, which is two to the five. So just one final example um, that I couldn't resist showing you about how Pascal's triangle, despite how very simple it's constructed, it hides all these really wonderful and profound number relationships. So I hope you enjoyed that, I hope it made sense. Think carefully, even when you meet something that looks quite unfamiliar, it will often be couched in language that you can use, you know, examples for example, for, for instance, numerical examples are often a really good way to make sense of what something is asking you, uh, and then you can proceed with the logic that you know from the nature of proof.